Charles Darwin's research and the development of his evolutionary theory provide a very good model for scientific investigation. But traditionally, it's been a rather dry topic and quite difficult to teach. And there's not a huge amount of time in the curriculum to do it. But teaching how the Earth's diverse population of flora and fauna came to be can be done imaginatively. And this programme will show you how. We've come to Balshaw Church of England Secondary School in Lancashire to see how animal masks, kitchen tools and passionate argument can be used to engage learners. The shape of our skulls are the same as apes from millions of years ago. Yeah, but there's many gaps in science. And to put a radical new slant on an old subject. Head of Science Caroline Molyneux was the North West's Outstanding Teacher of the Year in 2007. I put an I'm a knife. To say what sort of animal it's related to. It's like corrugated, like a bone. So what do you think that is? A spine? Yeah. In the water? Oh, yeah, fish. Yeah. So it would She's fantastic holding. because she has all the sort of fundamentally good practice uh, alongside fun, alongside a desire for children to learn, alongside for them to use their own thinking skills, be independent thinkers, find out for themselves and make science come to life. A classic lesson on evolution is built around Charles Darwin's research into finches on the Galapagos Islands. Individual species of finches evolved on the islands cut off from the rest of the world. Birds evolved beaks shaped to allow them access to specific foods found on each island. On Adam's Island, which is Santiago, what's, what sort of food is on your island? Uh, uh, large large nuts. nuts. Right, like large nuts. That was a bad choice, wasn't it? Uh, Jenny, what sort of food is on Fernandina? Small, like, fruit radishes kind of thing. Yeah, small vegetables that finches can pick up. But what you've got to make a decision on is which bird you think lives on the island. And you'll notice on each island I've put four bird types that are represented by different types of pincers. And you've got to make a decision as to which beak belongs to which island, OK? You've got about uh, seven and a half minutes to do it. Off you go. Caroline cleverly designed the task using a range of implements, from kitchen tongs to tweezers to recreate types of beak. I wanted to set something up like a mystery with the new schemes of work for Key Stage 4 in science. Uh, it's not just all about facts. They've got to be able to think through the answers. They've got to be able to use their own investigative skills to uh, discover something uh, that Darwin originally found himself. OK, Pinter, what type of a beak can pick up those large fruit? Number one, because uh, you're not going to need something so precise because it's massive. That's correct, number one. All right, next one, Fernandina. I put number three, cos, like, the small, so they don't need, like, big beaks to get them, cos then they wouldn't pick them up as easy. Ryan. Santa Cruz, beak type for the worms. I put number four. Right, number four. Because that's quite small compared to all the others and it'd be easier to pick them up because they're only small. OK. So let's take a look at Darwin's finches here. But you've got to now relate the real finches to each island based on the task that you've just done. But we're not talking about tongues now, we're talking about a bird with a beak and the food type on that island. The students are given a worksheet to help relate their practical investigations to the beak shape of the finches on each island. Pinter would be like the small one, because there were the small pinches where next there were small worms. Yeah. Santiago, number two. Yeah. Which is... Large nuts. Large nuts, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, let's have Jade for Pinter. Number one. Why do you think it's number one? Is it needs a big beak to pick up the large fruits yeah. that are left. It needs the largest beak. All right. Next one, Fernandina. Put three. Why do you think that? It, like, it needs a medium beak so it can pick up the radish and stuff. And finally, um, Jody Santiago. Uh, two, because it's got like quite a round beak but still quite big so that it can pick up the big knots. Once they'd worked out what was in it on each island, um, they then had to uh, f work out how the finches came from one original finch. How could five
five in this case, different finches come from the original finch. I've put some keywords down the side here. You don't have to use them all, but the keywords there to help you. By just giving them five keywords that they can help them to, to make their own sentences, you're actually uh, using higher level thinking, you're getting them to construct their own, um, their own sentences as to how, uh, how it happened. And that's using, you know, analysis, it's using synthesis, it's using the higher order skills that are, are going to be needed when they eventually leave school. Suddenly there was an environmental change and there was, a, there was only big nuts on that island. All the little ones died out. So what happens to the birds there? Only uh, some survive. Yeah, only some survive. Which ones survive? The ones with the big beaks. The ones with the big beaks, all the others die off. And so if you come back in 100 years, what will all the birds be like on the island? Uh, big beaks. Yes, yeah, so that's what evolution is. They don't just grow a big beak. Yeah. It's selection of the ones that will survive the best. Here's a tip to wrap things up. Simply ask students to write one fact about Charles Darwin on a sticky note. Evolution is animals adapting to their environment. Is that right, adapting to their environment? It is kind of right, but it's kind of wrong because it's a... Uh, a mutation process like it's the like one of them and they're the ones that survive because they're they're like they're the ones that adapted well and like they pass on their genes yes okay very good right okay can you put your stools under make sure you take your things with you it's break off you go one of the best teachers we got in school when she does the lessons she gets she makes everyone get involved and it's not just writing it's everyone's involved and it's activities and stuff like that you've got to get them engaged with it if you want them to, you know if you want it to sink in you want them to understand it and evolution is something you have to understand you can't just learn it parrot fashion <laughs> Man's descent from the great apes has provided Caroline with another opportunity for an engaging lesson. Right, OK. And she plays some monkey music to get them in the mood. This is the lineup of human history, OK? Jay, can you go and put them in order, please? OK, you happy with that? Why do you think that? Because that's bigger. OK, <laughs> that one's bigger, right? And okay. that one's more like a human. Yeah, that one's got some human features. OK, right, thank you very much, Jim. The mask, it's like a hook to get them thinking about the fact that we're moving from ape to human with evolution. David's got much more ape-like features than the others because he's not only got the ape head, and it's a bigger ape, isn't it? It's a bigger gorilla. Then we've got Matthew. Yeah, Matthew, is, he's got human hands, OK? But he's still got the ape, the ape head. Then we've got Nathan. <laughs> OK, he's lost the hair off his face. So he is the next one in the evolution of humans. And finally, Emma at the end here, OK, is the evolution of humans complete. I think they deserve a round of applause. OK. It's a bit crude, it's a little bit of a joke, isn't it? But it does lead on nicely to the fossil record of the schools through evolution of man. You've got to engage the pupils with what they're, they're learning. You've got to find ways into their way of thinking. It's such a dry topic, evolution. And the maths at the end where they have to ask, answer the questions as an ape or as a human. At that age, they're willing to volunteer for anything. First one is prominent teeth. Is that an ape or is it a human? What do you think? Is it an ape? Yeah, that is me. I have prominent teeth. <laughs> A narrow nasal opening. Uh, is that human? I have a narrow nasal opening. Well done. OK, well done. Engaging at the start and the end of the lesson is always, you know, useful and memorable for them to remember that, the, the facts from that lesson. She likes to laugh and she Can makes it interesting. Yeah. She makes lessons fun. She wants music on at the beginning, relaxes the mood, so, uh, you know, gets us all in the zone for lessons, you know. Bolshaw School has links with a local church, and Ruth Taylor, the youth chaplain, holds lunchtime drop-in sessions where young people can share their views and opinions on religious issues, the Bible and on evolution. So this account in Genesis, it tells us about why we're here and why God created the world, but it doesn't tell us how, OK? It doesn't give scientific explanation of the process. I think it is very important that, that youngsters realise that even though you might have a stack of evidence that would, 
you know, make it seem obvious. You know, there are still questions and points that can be analysed and looked at, you know, from the question of faith. I'm happy for, for in the context of this school, for people to ask me about my views on the subject of evolution. Um, and I will be honest with them about thinking it through. Um, but I think it's really important that they're encouraged to explore the theories for themselves and make up their own minds. In a step that not all science teachers would be comfortable with, Caroline Molyneux actively uses creationism as a tool in the science curriculum. She's developed a carefully structured lesson where students debate the creationists' argument against the scientific theory of evolution. Science is not just about learning facts and learning knowledge. On the exam, they will ask you questions about what people think of things how people argue what they believe. The two sides of the debate have an expert to help steer their research. Caroline guides the science of the pro-evolutionists. Have we got anything about fossils? Um, we're saying that it's from th 350 million years ago and it's now a, it was a snail and they've adapted now um, for the world changing. That is an ancestor of a snail and so we can see that it relates to today's snails. And youth chaplain Ruth Taylor is helping the procreationists shape their counter argument. There are lots of gaps in science which have not been proven, so you can't believe in science alone, as in because there's got to be a creator or something. Haven't so there? you're kind of saying that evolution doesn't explain the development of really complex um, organisms on you, I guess? Yeah. So we'll start off with evolution. Why should we believe that evolution created the Earth? The evidence of evolution has come from four, four sources. Fossils that have been found of early living things, the similarities of living things on Earth, like the snail fossil. The places where we find living things today, the changes in genes of living organisms over the years. To prove that, the shape of our skulls are the same as apes from millions of years ago. OK, right, thank you very much. So let's move on to the other side now, the opposing side, who are against evolution. There's no scientific law that allows something to evolve from nothing. If there was nothing in the universe to begin with, obviously nothing could happen to cause anything to appear. No mechanism has been put forward that even begins to explain how something like the human eye could have been produced by time, chance, natural selection and mutation. What you see when you do give uh, two sides of an argument is you see engagement with the topic, you see passion building for the science. So why is uh, Darwin's theory so trustworthy and believable? How do you know Darwin's theory is so trustworthy? Where's the evidence? quite a bit of proof about how species changed after a certain amount of time and he also proved about different the same species but so how, they, how they changed differently in different areas. Yeah, there's yeah but there's many gaps in science. But and what then... gaps have you got for God? There's not a gap, it's just not there full stop. Maybe he was the one who actually created evolution. Maybe he was left left us here to adapt by ourselves. In general, science, you know, if you can create some passion for it, then they're engaging, they're learning, and um, it's a real triumph, I think. That's what the new skills-based curriculum is all about. It, some people find it better to believe in something than nothing. Yeah, we do believe in something, that's evolution.